Hi, my name is Mark McLennan. I'm the general manager of C plus C's Boston office, the host of Ethical Voices, and the 2016 PRSA National Chair. And I'm here today to talk about training your ethical mind. Why do we act unethically? And how can we help prevent it? And when I talk about ethics, most people immediately think of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And unless they're a philosophy or an ethics geek, they groan and they want to tune out. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to talk about something completely different today. We're going to talk about Hershey's Kisses. And when I think about Hershey's Kisses, I think about love. I think about how good it tastes. I think about what an awesome job that would be to do public relations for Hershey's Kisses. What are the big crises you're concerned about? You know, is it promoting obesity? Is it labor relations? Is it competition from Reese's peanut butter cups? What you probably don't expect is walking in one morning and understanding that your nice, beautiful, tasty candy is being accused of promoting child labor and child slavery. Yet that's exactly what happened. Most of the chocolate for Hershey's Kisses comes from Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire. And frankly, they have a choice there. They can work with the multinationals to help farm the cocoa, but then all that money goes out of those countries. Or they can work with the local family farms. And by working with the local family farms, the money stays in the community, but the parents on these farms may decide their kids are better off working at the farms rather than going to school. And so that creates a lot of systemic issues. Now, I'm simplifying a very complex issue. There's a lot of permutations to it. Hershey's has responded to this, but it just shows you that what your day is or where the ethics challenges may come from may not be ones that you expect. And how you act on it and how you think about, do I have an ethical issue, really depends on how you evaluate it. And I spent an entire semester with my students addressing this, and I'm going to condense it down to about 45 seconds. There's really three core approaches to evaluating if a decision is ethical or unethical. There's something we call deontology, which is the nature of the act. Is lying always wrong? Is giving a job to somebody you know, giving a kickback always wrong, yes or no? Then there's teleology, which looks at the consequence of the act. If you're getting the greatest good by doing this, it's ethical. The problem being with teleology is that often the rights of the minorities are sacrificed and not protected. And finally, the third school of thought, kind of we have the Pepsi, the Coke, and here's the Dr. Pepper, is virtue-based. Are you being virtuous? Are you being honest? Do you have magnanimity? Are you generous? Are you caring? Now, every one of these has pros and cons and flaws, but you can realize if you look at a situation through these different lenses, you can come to very different conclusions. But regardless of what approach you use, one constant is words are not enough. You can't just say you're ethical. You need to act and you need to be ethical. And we've seen that over the past year and a half, that this is presenting us new opportunities for old failures. Whether it's the lockdown and e-cigarette companies doing some questionable advertising and promotions, leveraging the hashtags, stay at home to try to encourage people to vape. Whether it's all the organizations that are responding and getting involved in Black Lives Matter. It's an important cause. Yes, Black Lives Matter. But the question is, are you just saying this? Are you actually putting action behind the words? And that caused me to think, why are people making poor ethical decisions? And really, I put it into kind of a mnemonic device, the 26 reasons, the ABCs of ethical failures, because understanding why people are making unethical choices helps you advise them on how to avoid it and helps you realize where the challenges could be coming from. You know, the most basic of them is apathy. It's, I don't want to speak up. I have a lot of other things going on. Is it really that big a deal? And if you don't make those issues, if you don't address it head on, when you first discover an ethical issue, it gets to be tougher to address it in the future. There's the unconscious bias that we all bring. When I look at my perspective, I may have biases that mean I don't realize that something I'm doing is unethical. And I think every group has that, and so you have to be aware of that. Probably the biggest one for public relations professionals is the conflicting goals and duties. You know, we have a duty to ourselves. We have a duty to our employers. We have a duty to our families. 
If you're looking at the duties to society in the community, or duty to an agency, if you're working at an agency, and what happens when those duties are in conflict? Who do you go with? Where do you have the issue? Do you put the duty to the company above the duty to your family or the duty to the community? Or if you put the duty to the community first, do you jeopardize your company's reputation? And this is probably the single greatest challenge that PR professionals face is how do we balance those conflicting duties? You know, so people act unethically because they're desperate. Oh my gosh, I'm going to bind. I need to cheat and cut the corners. Or it's envious that I want what they have. Nobody's going to notice these things. So let's go and do it. It's fear of I'm going to lose my job if I speak out against my boss when he asks me to do something. It's the greed. If I do this, I'm going to hit my quota. I'm going to get my year end bonus. There's so many different elements there. A couple of other key ones I want to highlight. You know, lying is one of the core ones. It's rarely due to knavery or malfeasance or people just being bad actors. But there's also the lack of questioning. My boss told me this. The CEO gave us this data. These are the numbers my client gave me. So, of course, they're right. And you may end up inadvertently perpetuating lies. It's the rationalization. You know what? Everyone else is cheating here. Everybody else inflates claims. If we don't inflate claims, we're at a competitive disadvantage. It's the unrealistic expectations. If I don't make this promise, I'm not going to win this client. I'm not going to win this deal. I'm not going to get the promotion. But frankly, by having them, you set yourself up for failure and cutting corners down the road. So when you're really looking at it, why people are doing it gives you the guidance and how you can go and how you can address it. And when I go beyond the 26 reasons, I also look at what are nine common ethical landmines for today. Probably the biggest and the one that scares me the most is I believe we're at the rise of the disinformation age. We are seeing more misinformation and disinformation being spread more effectively using technology. This is going to be as transformative as the rise of the internet was in the mid-90s. And as communicators, one of our biggest challenges is going to be, how do we fight back against disinformation? All of the elements with COVID-19, from HIPAA to hazard pay to work from home to equity to all the all elements that come forward there, there's a lot of ethical issues that get involved in there. The events of the past few years have really shown us the importance of not just being um, clear, but make sure you're being anti-racist. You know, we need to do how can we address the systemic racism and the systemic inequalities that our organizations and businesses have been perpetuating over the decades. Sexual harassment and assault has always been one of the issues there. You need to make sure that you're taking everything seriously and aggressively and working with HR and the management on these issues. What do you do when your product isn't living up to what your claims are? What do you do when you want to protect your leadership and you want to make sure that your CEO or your VP of sales is the allegation right? Or maybe we want to keep them from knowing about it so they can plausibly deny it later. And that gets to be an ethical slippery slope. Data collection is going to be a huge issue. Every company is collecting data. How do we use it? How do we share it? How do we make sure we're being ethical overall in what we're doing? As well as IP theft. There's too many issues, especially with young professionals. Oh, I found this image on the internet. I can use it. Oh, I saw this quote. I can just repurpose it without giving attribution. If you avoid these, you're probably avoiding 80 to 90% of the common reasons for ethical missteps that get people and get companies in trouble. And that's why I tell all my employees and all the students that you need to understand our role is to be the ethics voice of an organization. And we need to make sure we're keeping in mind it's what the organization stands for. What are our purposes? What are our values? It's not about the CEO or the board. If you're an employee, your job is to protect the organization. You need to make sure, though, you're human. You're going to make mistakes. Own your own lens in the world. Own the mistakes that you've made and learn from them. Don't be defined by them. Use them as a diagnostic tool to really understand how can you do better moving forward in the future. And that's what I call training your ethical mind. As communicators, we need to make sure we're training and always getting better when we're providing ethics counsel. Ethics needs to be honed like a golfer hones their swing because that's going to make us better able to execute under pressure. 
And why does this matter? Because there was an Academy of Management study a few years ago that shows people are five times more likely to make the ethical decision when they have time to think. And I don't know about you, but when it comes to a public relations professional's day, we don't have the time to think. We're constantly going from point to point. So we need to really train ourselves to apply that lens and get to the point so we can address the issue and flag the ethical challenge early before it overcomes us. And this is just based on millions of years of biology. You know, that the immediate automatic moral intuition tends to be selfish. Giving self-interest is a basic instinctual response to external stimuli. We want to think what's best for us. You need to go beyond that and think what's best for your organization, what's best for society. And it's only when we're taking that contrast, that deliberative thought, and adding in the social concerns that we can go beyond this. So I like to say it's the 10,000-hour rule, you know, which a lot of other people have talked about for training skills. The same thing applies to ethical decision-making. Ethical decisions and ethical cultures come from you. And that 10,000 hour rule gives us a hint. We can train it by thinking about ethics, not just during a college ethics course, not just during ethics training once a year, but overall, we can make sure we're being the ethics guardians and giving the best advice. And that's by practice. Make it a regular part of your team meetings. Make it a regular part of your classes and highlighting what are the ethics issues. In the ethics course I teach, the first 30 to 40 minutes, all we do is talk about what are the ethical issues of the week so people can get trained and used to hearing what are the challenges. But make sure it's not just the communication team. Every employee of every business can break trust and hurt your client and hurt your company because of unethical decisions. You need to flay these items for executives, for training, so it can be communicated. You need to have regular ethics discussions with your staff and your peers. If you're working at an agency or client, make sure you involve your partner. It's going to let you understand how they think. The way I do it, as I said, highlight a situation you've seen. Ask people what they saw and thought. If you're the manager, you should not be the first one talking. Once you raise an ethics issue, very few people are going to want to say, well, you know what, boss, you're wrong. So let them share because, frankly, it may help you understand those biases you bring that other people can understand and engage it and help them work through the process. This is going to help others train their mind, think ethically, understand the importance that you put on ethics, and frankly, it can uncover issues that you haven't considered. There are many different ethics methodologies. I think Shannon Bowen, Marlene Neal have some great ones. The way I look at it, I kind of try to blend the teleology, deontology, and virtue base. The core element is identify the issue. What's the ethics challenge? What's causing concern? Discuss it. It's not just your own. Go find a mentor, find a colleague, bounce ideas off each other. Because frankly, by having that discussion, you're going to make sure you're addressing your biases. Make the call. And then once you make the call, this is something a lot of ethics models fail on. Revisit it. What did we learn? What can we do better next time? What can we address? What do we need to change in our companies? Only by doing that, you're going to raise the bar to make sure everyone is more effective now and in the future. But it's not just you. I mentioned calling a colleague. Look to the codes. There are great codes of ethics out there. PRSA has a powerful code of ethics. The page principles are what's applied and used by the top communications officers at the largest companies. And I think they're very powerful. Go to my blog and podcast, ethicalvoices.com. I have interviews every week with a real pro discussing real ethical issues they addressed. But the codes are references. Don't memorize them. Go back, constantly refresh and understand what you're doing. A few concluding thoughts that I wanted to leave you with. One, you're human. You're going to screw up. Be prepared for the barbecue. Somebody in your company is going to act unethically at some point. How do you address it? No matter all the training you do, there's still going to be the failures. The question is, how do you work to minimize the failures? And when they happen, how do you respond? Ethisphere, which recognizes the world's most ethical companies, has a great quote and a great state. Being an ethical company doesn't mean you're perfect. Companies are made up of people. People make mistakes. But it means when something happens, you respond 
quickly and ethically. And if you do that, you're going to gain trust and you're going to make your organization even more effectively. The bottom line is reputation is based on trust. And trust comes from ethical behavior. Profits come from strong reputations. Strong reputations come from ethical decisions. Ethical decisions can and must be trained. And as Albert Einstein says, relativity applies to physics, not ethics. Thank you. Have a great day.